thank you so much for sharing your testimony. That was so powerful. Last week, uh, I shared with you a question that Pastor Spurgeon asked many, many years ago. Can a heart be full of rejoicing and heavy with grief and sorrow at the same time? And the answer to that question is absolutely. Absolutely. But it does not come natural. The grief and sorrow come naturally to us. It's what we experience in life. But the heart being filled with rejoicing, that does not come naturally to us. For those of you who have placed your faith in Jesus, those that are followers of Jesus, the more we grow in our love and our passion for the Lord, the more we will understand His love and His presence in our lives. The more time that we spend in God's Word, the more time we spend in God's Word, the more familiar we will become with what God has done for us in Jesus Christ, in reconciling us to Himself, in giving us new birth into a living hope, and in giving us an inheritance that can never be taken away, can never spoil and never fade in its glory. Every person, every single person in the sanctuary, whether you are a follower of Jesus or not, we will all go through the trials of life, fiery trials of life. For those who are followers of Jesus, God's Word teaches you and me that our trials and troubles, they are not random. You and I are not the victims of some random, careless universe. But God desires to use our trials and the troubles of life to draw us to Himself. And to mold us and shape us into the image of his son, Jesus. Just this past Wednesday morning, I was meeting with some men in our church. Every Wednesday morning at 6.30, all of you guys are invited to come. We have Bible study here at 6.30 on Wednesday morning. And in our study this past Wednesday morning, one of the questions was, what is your reconciliation story? <clears throat> How did you come to see your need for Jesus? It was so interesting to listen to the guys share. Several of them talked about a time in their life when they were empty, broken by pain and sorrow that showed them they didn't have what it takes. They couldn't navigate those choppy waters. God used the situations that they were having to deal with in their life to show them their need for Jesus Christ. Well, this morning we're going to take a look at verses 8 and 9. We tried to make it through 6 through 9 last Sunday, but we only made it through verse 7. Let's go back and read 6, 7, 8, and 9, and then we'll jump into 8 and 9. Read, read along with me. Peter writes, In all of this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith, of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, that it may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Though you have not seen Him, you love Him. And even though you do not see Him now, you believe in Him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls. As I mentioned, we'll skip over verses 6 and 7, and we'll focus on verses 8 and 9. That way, I can promise you, you'll, we'll get through with our study this morning. If you'll remember, Peter was writing to scattered followers of Jesus in five Roman provinces between 60 and 62 A.D., a long, long time ago. Jesus had been crucified and resurrected almost 30 years prior to the time when Peter sat down and wrote this letter. And the recipients of this letter in churches across those provinces, they were made up of men, women, and children who were being persecuted because of their love and their commitment to Jesus. If you'll take a look at verse 8, Peter writes, Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. Peter makes an absolutely remarkable statement right in the beginning of verse 8 when he says, Though you have not seen him, 
you love him. And though you do not see him now, you believe in him. Folks, that statement in our society, in our day, is absolutely unacceptable to most people. Loving someone you've never seen. I remember many years ago as I was studying this verse this past week, many years ago I was invited to go to John Marshall High School and to speak to a group of students. One of the teachers there invited me. She asked that I would share my story and then leave some time open at the end for questions. So I knew a lot of the kids at John Marshall because they came to church here. They played basketball in the gym. So I was excited to go. And after I shared my story, I said, do you guys have any questions? And the first question that came to me was this. How can you believe in someone you've never met? Someone that you aren't even sure ever lived. So... I shared some historical evidence from a guy named Josephus and another guy named Tacitus, a Jewish historian and a Roman historian who wrote in the first century. Neither one of them were followers of Jesus, and yet they wrote about this man named Jesus who lived and died under Pontius Pilate. It was a lock-tight, convincing case. It made no dent in the kid. He said, well, I can't believe in someone that I can't see. If I'm going to believe, then I need to see for myself. I said, let me, make, let, let me make sure I'm understanding what you're saying. You don't believe in anything or anyone that you can't see. Yeah, that's right. I said, do you believe in a place called Australia? Yeah. I said, have you ever been there? No, I never have. I said, then how can you believe in a place that you've never visited before. I've seen video and pictures. I said, well, I've seen videos of things that Hollywood has created that aren't real at all. How do you know Australia's real? He said, I just know. I said, well, let me ask you. If I were you, I would want to go to Australia. I'd want to stand on the beach. I'd want to watch a kangaroo hop around before I finally decided that I believe in this place. I've seen it with my own eyes. He didn't say anything. I said, let me ask you a couple of other questions. Do you believe in the wind? He said, sure. I said, but you've never seen the wind. You've seen the effects of the wind. You can go out to Lake Hefner and fly a kite, and you know something's holding that thing up there, but you can't see what's holding it up there. Or how about radio waves? Can you believe, I told the kids, this room is filled with radio waves. Everywhere you look, but you can't see them. You'll never see even one. But if you bring a radio into our classroom and you turn it on and you begin to turn the dial, you'll find those radio waves, even though you'll never see one. I said, you see, we all have faith. And we place our faith in people and things each and every day. It just so happens I've placed my faith in Jesus Christ because I believe that he is who he claimed to be. And I believe that he has done what he said he would do. He died for my sins and for your sins. And he rose from the dead so that you and I might have the opportunity to be reconciled to the Father. I said, you know, we place our faith in people and things all the time that we learn later on. I should have never done that. I said, every single person I've ever placed my faith in, they've let me down. And every person who's ever placed their faith in me, I have let them down. Jesus has never let me down. And I believe that he never will. <clears throat> you see, what I heard that young man say at John Marshall, I have heard that over and over and over again in all of the years that I've been here. People that say, I just can't believe. I just can't believe in someone that I've never seen before. One man told me, I have a scientific mind. I, I, I can't have faith because I have a scientific mind. My mind just doesn't work with faith like that. He was engaged to a Christian. And somehow, some way, he knew that the Bible said that a believer should not marry an unbeliever. 
So he called me. This was a friend of mine. He was not a Christian. He came to church here very randomly, very sporadically. And he said, hey, I'm in a problem. Can, can I come by and talk to you? I said, sure, come on by. So he pulled up out front in his Harley. He got off. He came into my office and he told me, here's my problem. You know I'm not a Christian. But I love her. And she's a follower of Jesus. And I wouldn't do anything to hurt her. And the Bible says I shouldn't marry her. What do you think? I said, I think you should give your life to Jesus and marry her. He said, you, you know my mind doesn't work like that. I can't have faith. I have a scientific mind. I said, that's not true. You have faith like everybody else. Your faith is just not in Jesus. I said, look, show me the evidence that if you marry her, she will stay with you all of the days of your life instead of abandoning you. How do you know that if you marry her, you'll stay married to her until the end of your life? You could see the wheels turn in his head. I said, you don't need to answer the question. Here's the answer. You have faith. And why in the world would you place your faith in a person who is as fallible as you and not place your faith in Jesus? He said, I've never looked at it that way before. And before he left my office, he prayed to accept Christ as his Lord and Savior. I said, you know, the next step is for, to be baptized as an outward sign of what the Lord has already done in, into your life. And I explained to him, being plunged beneath the water into a watery grave and being raised to a newness of life, he goes, when can we do it? I said, when do you want to? He said, now. So we filled the baptistry, and that day he was baptized as a follower of Jesus. My point in sharing these stories with you is this. Seeing is not believing. The two do not equate. There were so many people in Israel who saw Jesus. They saw him do miracle after miracle after miracle. They listened to him teach, and yet they refused to believe. They refused to believe. John tells us in John 12, 37, even after Jesus had performed so many signs in their presence, they still would not believe in him. Thomas was one of Jesus' disciples. Nobody had a greater vantage point for observing Jesus' life in an intimate way than his disciples. I mean, Thomas was there when Jesus turned water into wine. Thomas was there when Jesus fed 5,000 people with five loaves of bread and two fish. And Thomas was there in the boat when the wind kicked up and the waves were raging on the Sea of Galilee and Jesus would simply be still. Caused all of it to come, become quiet. Thomas had never heard anybody teach like Jesus could teach. He remembers sitting on the hill on the outside of the Sea of Galilee when Jesus delivered the Sermon on the Mount. It was there on the steps of the temple in Jerusalem that Thomas listened to Jesus teach. And it was around the campfire just with Jesus and the guys that he gave some of his most important lessons. But you see, none of that mattered to Thomas when Jesus hung his head as he hung on the cross and said, it is finished. Jesus was dead. Thomas was disappointed. He went back to life as he knew it. The disciples told him, no, 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 he's alive. He's alive. Jesus is alive. He's risen from the dead. And Thomas said, I won't believe it. I won't believe it unless I put my fingers in his hands, unless I place my hand in his side. I am not going to believe it. And then in John 20, verse 20 through 20, 26 through 29, we read, A week later, Jesus' disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands? Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. And Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, because you have seen me, you have believed. But blessed are those who have not seen 
and yet have believed. Did you hear that? Jesus told Thomas, Thomas, you believe because you've seen me, but blessed are those who have never seen me, and yet they believe. <clears throat> those early followers of Jesus that were scattered throughout Pontius, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, they had never laid eyes on Jesus. Remember, we're talking about 30 years after his resurrection and ascension, and yet Peter says, Peter who saw Jesus with his own eyes, he said, even though you've never seen him, you love him. And you're blessed. You're blessed because you believe. And let me tell those of you that are here this morning, you've never seen him, not with your own eyes. But those of you that are followers of Jesus this morning, you are blessed because you have placed your faith in Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Those followers of Jesus who received this letter from Simon Peter, they didn't just believe with some kind of mental assent. They didn't just intellectually believe, yes, I believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the long-awaited Jew, Jew, Jewish Messiah. Peter says, though you've not seen him, you love him. You love him. I've mentioned to you before, many times before, the Greek language is much more precise in many ways than our English language. The, the greatest example is love. And the word that's used here, agapao, is the word which, even though it stirs deep emotion within, it is really a love of the will. It is a love of choice. It's not a touchy-feely, I love you as long as you meet my expectations kind of love. It is a love that is set upon you and never removed. That's why this word, most often it's used to describe the kind of love that God has demonstrated for you and for me. Let me give you some examples so that you can better understand choice love. Choice love. Look at John 13, 1. It was just before the Passover festival. Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and to go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. <clears throat> he loved them to the end. You see, Peter's denial of Jesus wouldn't diminish Jesus' love of Peter. And Thomas' doubts, they couldn't diminish Jesus' love for Thomas. Jesus chose to love his disciples. He chooses to love you. He chooses to love me. And he will love us to the end. Turn with me to Romans 8, verse 35. I want to give you another example. In Romans 8, 35, the Apostle Paul, he writes, Who shall separate us from the love of God in Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all of these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? And the answer is absolutely nothing. His love for you and his love for me is not based upon our performance. It's not based upon our ability to walk the straight and narrow. And it's not based upon the consistency of your faithfulness to him. He has chosen to love you. There is nothing you can do to change that love. He's chosen to love you. How freeing is that when you consider that most often our love for others and others' love for us is based upon their meeting our expectations and our meeting their expectations. <clears throat> he has chosen to love you in the past. He loves you at this very moment. And he will love you with an unfading love until your very last breath. And then he will love you into eternity. Amen. Can I give you just one more example? Turn to Ephesians chapter 2 with me. Ephesians 2, verses 4 and 5, where Paul says, But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, 
He made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace that you have been saved. It is because of God's love for us and not because of anything that we've done to earn his love that he has acted through Jesus' life, his death, and his resurrection to reconcile us to himself and to give us a new purpose in life to give us a new mission in life, and to give us a new joy and delight that this world knows nothing about outside of a relationship with Jesus Christ. Once we become aware, once we become aware of all that God has done for us, it stirs an even deeper love in our heart for him. That's why John wrote in 1 John 4, we love Because he first loved us. There's something that's important for us to recognize and to understand about the love that Peter writes about. The love of these early persecuted followers of Jesus. The word that Peter used to describe their love, it's in the present tense. The present tense. You know what that tells us? That tells us that their love for Jesus was unaffected by the various trials of life that they were going through. It tells us that persecution could not persuade them to stop loving Jesus. It tells us that the loss of a loved one couldn't turn their hearts away from loving Jesus. And it tells us that even though they were made outcast in their community because of their love for Jesus, that would never ever crumble their love and devotion to their Savior. I thought about this so much this past week. I've asked myself this question. Is my love for Jesus a present tense love for Jesus? Do you know what I'm talking about? Is my love for Jesus as strong and bold during the dark, stormy times of my life as it is on those calm, enjoyable days? Do the tough times of life cause me to question his love for me and and at the same time reveal my weak, feeble trust in him? I want a present tense love for Jesus. Like those early followers that Peter was praising. They were being squeezed by the hardships of life, by persecution, heartache, and yet they presently love the Lord. Nothing could change that. Most of you have been around long enough to know that this world is filled with trouble. It's filled with hardships unimaginable and sorrow that can sap your strength and leave you hopeless. If our love for the Lord is dictated by the degree of good things that come our way, then we will never ever experience the present tense love of Jesus that will carry us through the hardest times of life. Many years ago, there was a man named Cyprian who lived in Carthage on the northern coast of Africa in the country of Tunisia today. He was born into a really wealthy family, about 200 A.D. He got the greatest of education, and he excelled at rhetoric, the ancient art of persuasion. He was so good and so popular that he opened his own school, and he would oftentimes debate other other philosophers and Christians, notable Christians. He had a friend who was a Christian. And when Cyprian was 45 years old, that friend persuaded Cyprian and he became a follower of Jesus. In the same way that Cyprian had poured himself into the study of rhetoric, Cyprian now poured himself into the study of understanding of Christianity and who Jesus was, and what it meant for his life to be a disciple of Jesus. Well, in no time, he became a deacon in the church at Carthage. And then he became a priest. And then in 248 A.D., when the bishop of the church died, the church chose Cyprian to be the bishop of the church in Carthage. Remember that date, 248 A.D. Shortly after Cyprian became the bishop, Emperor Decius, the Roman emperor, unleashed a horrible persecution and many people in Carthage were killed. Cyprian lost all of his worldly goods. He escaped with his life. And then in 252 AD, four years, four years after he became the bishop, 
A pandemic broke out, a horrible pandemic that lasted 20 years. And Cyprian was overwhelmed, caring, with members, caring for members of his church that were dying and pleading with the rest that were not sick, please don't flee town. Use this as an opportunity to minister to your dying neighbors. That was in 252. Then Emperor Decius died, and a new emperor rose to power. His name was Emperor Valerian. And in 258, he sent out a decree while the Roman army was battling the Persians that all Roman citizens needed to make sacrifice to the Roman gods, and those that did not would suffer severe consequences. Well, it was September the 14th, 258, when the Roman authorities brought Cipri in, and they questioned him. They interrogated him. They gave him the opportunity to make sacrifice to the Roman gods, but he could not. And so they said, do you realize, Cyprian, we will kill you if you don't make sacrifice? He said, I cannot. So they took him out and they beheaded him. And the report is that when they took him out, he was a very popular church leader. When they took him out, a vast number of Christians followed out with him. When they got him to the place of execution, he fell to his knees and began praying. And when the sword fell and beheaded Cyprian, those Christians that were watching, they didn't shrink back in fear of the Roman authorities. They were emboldened to stand for the cause of Christ. 248, 258, 10 long years of suffering for Cyprian. Two Roman emperors, two persecutions, a pandemic, he lost all of his earthly possessions, and yet even the threat of death could not cause him to fall away because he had a present tense love for Jesus. That's what you and I need, a present tense love for Jesus. During his life, Cyprian, he wrote a young friend of his named Donatus, and this is what he wrote. We have his letter. Listen to this. Cyprian writes, Donatus, this is a cheerful world as I see it from my garden under the shadow of my vines. But if I were to as ascend some high mountain and look out over the wide lands, you know very well what I should see. Brigands on the highways, pirates on the sea, armies fighting, citizens, uh, cities burning, and in the amphitheaters, men murdered to please applauding crowds. Selfishness and cruelty and misery and despair under all roofs. It is a bad world, Donatus. An incredibly bad world. But I have discovered in the midst of it a quiet and holy people who have learned a great, great secret. They have found a joy which is a thousand times better than any pleasure of arts and a full life. They are despised and persecuted, but they don't care. They are masters of their souls. They have overcome the world. These people, Donatus, are the Christians. And I am one of them. In the midst of a broken, tear-stained, bloody world filled with suffering, oppression, persecution, loss, and inhumane treatment of one person against another, one people group against another, one nation against another. There is a group of people who have found a joy that is better than anything this world has to offer. And their joy is not in this world. Their joy is rooted in Jesus and their relationship with him. Let me tell you, that was as true when Peter penned these words about this inexpressible and glorious joy. And it was true when Cyprian wrote to his young friend Donatus, and that same truth is still true this morning, right here for you and me at Britain Christian Church. One more time, let's read verses 8 and 9. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Isn't that beautiful? In loving, watch this, in loving Jesus, in believing in Jesus, you are filled with an inexpressible 
and glorious joy. For you're receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls. The joy that we experience in our relationship with Jesus, it is an inexpressible joy. The Greek word there means speech. Um, uh, it, it means speech that is higher than speech, indescribable speech. It's like some of us today, you say, well, how was that word? I don't have words. Words are not adequate. That's what it means. That's the joy that we have because of our relationship with the Lord. This joy is much like the peace that surpasses all understanding that we read about in Philippians 4, verses 6 and 7. Read that with me. Paul says, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank Him for all He has done. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything that we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and your minds as you live in Christ Jesus. If you've ever been in a situation that should have crumbled and crushed you, and yet you felt such an overwhelming sense of peace because you knew that the Lord was with you and that he was going to lead you through to the other side of that trial, then you know the peace that exceeds our understanding. His peace is indescribable, and yet you know it. His joy is indescribable, and yet you know it. And last of all, Peter reminds them that they are receiving the end result of their faith, which is the salvation of their souls. When Peter writes that they are receiving, that's in present tense also. Which is really interesting because most of us who are followers of Jesus, we look back upon our salvation. We'll talk about the, when we were saved or when we became a follower of Jesus. And, and that's not a wrong way of looking at salvation, but it doesn't give us the whole scope of the enormity of salvation. Yes, I remember when I prayed to become a follower of Jesus Christ. But let me tell you, He is saving me now, his salvation is at work in my life in this very moment and in your life if you are a follower of Jesus. And yet the fullest expression of our salvation will not be known, it will not be experienced until Jesus comes back for those who are his own. John MacArthur wrote these words, There is really no reason for believers to lose their joy when they can tap into all the present and future spiritual realities that are mentioned in this passage. What are they? Present proven faith, fellowship with Christ and deliverance, and a protected future inheritance and promised honor. As Jesus assured the apostles, these things, Jesus said, these things have I spoken to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. Amen. Filled to overflowing. Jesus said, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but I have come that they may have life and have it in abundance. Overflowing life. Overflowing joy. Even with tears running down our face. As we go through the fires, the fiery trials of life, we can still know his joy because our joy is not rooted in our circumstance and our situation. Our joy, our contentment is rooted in our relationship with Jesus. Amen. So before we go, I need to ask you a question. Let me start with those of you that are followers of Jesus. When you came into this sanctuary this morning, were you experiencing an inexpressible and glorious joy from, from the Lord? Do you know that inexpressible and glorious joy? If not, then I have to ask, why not? Is it because life is stealing his joy from your heart? Is it because you've lost somebody very significant, someone very precious and priceless and that loss has diminished his inexpressible joy in your life? Or is it because of disappointment? 
Life is not going the way that you envisioned it. And that disappointment is crushing his joy. Choking out his joy in your life. If that's the case, and you're willing to acknowledge that, what a blessing. What an incredible blessing that that the Lord would quicken you to that reality. That there's something in life that's choking out his joy. It's not that he hasn't given it. It's that we are allowing these circumstances to choke it out in our life. If you cry out to him, Lord, I want to know that inexpressible, glorious joy of yours once again. Or as David said, restore unto me the joy of my salvation. He will. I promise he will. And for those that are here that are not followers of Jesus, let me tell you, there is no way for you to know that inexpressible and glorious joy. There's just not, because you're not a follower of Jesus. It's like me looking at somebody that that hit the Powerball and won a billion dollars. I know what that's like, liar, liar, pants on fire. You don't have two quarters to rub together, and you say you know what it's like to hit a lottery? Let me tell you something much greater than a lottery wants to hit in your life this morning. The Lord is knocking on the door of your heart. Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If you will open that door, I will come in and fellowship with you. He's knocking on your heart this morning. Won't you come? Just like Jai said, that's the same process he walks all of us through. He knocks, he shows us our need, and there comes some point in our life that we don't harden our heart any longer, but we turn to him. And we come to know that inexpressible joy that is only his. So this morning, if you're not a follower of Jesus, but you would like to become a follower of Jesus this morning, don't worry about what people think around you. Keep your eyes fixed on him. And meet me down at the front this morning. Or if you're looking for a church home, you've been wandering around looking for a place and you feel like the Lord's calling you to put roots in here at Britain Christian Church, come forward and let me know that. We will welcome you with open arms. But please come as we stand and sing this song of invitation.